All right, everybody, we are ready to get started. I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. Rich is going to share some awesome insights about a topic that he gets really excited about and I get really excited about and I know a lot of you get really excited about as well. Um, just so you guys know, my name is Abby Jarvis and I'm part of the team over at QGive. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are an online fundraising tool for nonprofits. And we've got a whole suite of fundraising tools that we that we help our clients use to raise money, to share their stories with donors, and to get people excited about supporting them. Um, just before we get started, there are a couple housekeeping items I wanted to let you know about. Uh, the first, the first topic is that yes, I promise we are recording this webinar. Um, okay. You will get a, a recording sent to your inbox within a day or two, uh, just as we get everything uploaded and and ready to to share with you. Please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Rich and I can both see any questions that you have. We can also see you chatting to us. So if you've if you've got any questions or concerns, just chime in in the chat box over there, and we will make sure that we answer those questions. Um, you can follow along with this webinar uh, on Twitter if you use Twitter. Uh, the hashtag we use is QWebinar. I'll be live tweeting some of the highlights from Rich and retweeting anyone who tweets along with us. So I, I know that uh, you guys are probably tired of the housekeeping stuff. So before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple things about the presenter. Uh, Rich Deeds works with Tri Summit Solutions, and as I have learned, among many things, he is absolutely 100% passionate about nonprofit storytelling. Uh, your story is a huge, valuable part of your fundraising toolbox, and Rich has a ton of great insight to share about how you can use your story to its fullest. So, Rich, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. I will go ahead and grab control of the screen and share my screen. If you can let me know when it pops up there, Abby. It's there. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Uh, as Abby said, I am very passionate and geeky about this topic. I love nonprofit storytelling. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do with my clients. When I meet a new nonprofit, the first thing I ask them is, what's your favorite story? Because that a story tells me so much about the organization. It tells me who they are, what they do, and most importantly, why they do what they do and the impact that they're making in the community. So that is what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk today about something I'm even more passionate about, visual storytelling. So if using visual storytelling to engage, connect, and motivate your donors. As Abby mentioned, any questions you have, type them into the chat box. Um, I think Abby's definitely going to be keeping an eye on it. Um, I will kind of look at it as we're going. If I can't answer it right away, I will. If not, we will definitely have time at the end. I'm fine staying on as long as we have to to make sure all the questions are answered because we do have a ton of content to cover. So go ahead and throw them in the chat box. So to start out, I would love to get some information from you guys. Um, in the chat box, type in how you would rate your current storytelling abilities. Are you awesome? J.K. Rowling has nothing on us. You guys are just telling amazing stories and people are just paying on every word. Uh, it's okay, but I know we can do better. Or what do you mean storytelling helps? Um, definitely know that we need to be doing more of it. You can type into the chat box, you know, that, uh, that you, you know, what, where, where you guys think you are. Um, and as I'm looking for those, um, most of the folks I talk to, most of the clients I talk to, most of the nonprofits I talk to when I'm speaking, um, they're in that it's okay, but I know we can do better. Most nonprofits, there's so much information out there about storytelling, about how important it is. I think most nonprofits are trying to do it now, but really kind of struggling with what makes a good story. You know, is this really important? Why am I doing this? All that. I think that's what we're going to jump into in the session today, which I'm super excited about. So quick, uh, quick uh, agenda that we're going to do. We're going to talk about what is visual storytelling. We're going to talk about the power of stories, why they're so powerful, and why you should be doing them in everything that you do. Then bringing in a little bit on video and how to use video to better tell your stories. And this is going to be an easy way to use video. We're not going to get very complicated here. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So don't get nervous about the, the tech um, and the video side. And then finally, how to use social media and your stories together. And I'll tell you, I am not a big fan of social media. I don't love social media. I don't encourage my clients to do a lot of social media. I think we can see a much higher return on investment in other areas. But visual storytelling does lend itself really well to social media. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, we'll finish with a Q&A. 
So if you haven't been on a webinar with me before, who am I and why should you listen to me? Um, very briefly, the reason you should listen to me is because I've been in the nonprofit space my entire career. Um, I started working with a mentoring organization when I was in college so I can get some volunteer experience, ended up falling in love working with at-risk youth, ended up working with severely emotionally disturbed children, have a master's in social work, so about as nonprofit-y as you can get. And so why that's important is I know what it's like to work in a nonprofit. I know what it's like to work, especially small, medium-sized nonprofits, which is mostly what I worked in. You have no staff, no time, no budget, and you're told to do all these amazing things with technology, right? And you're like, yeah, right, after I get everything else done, I have to do and the, the 15 hats that I have to wear. So when I do a presentation like this, I'm going to give you guys a ton of ideas, a ton of strategies to go out there and test and try. I don't expect you to do them all. Pick one or two, try them out. If it works, you do more of it. If it doesn't, come back and try something else out. And most of the strategies that I'm going to tell you today, you can do with your current technology. As long as you have a website, a, a, a smartphone that has video on it, um, and a YouTube account, uh, you're pretty much good to go. Um, there's no extra tools that you really need to do everything that we're going to talk about today. So that's where it gets exciting for me is there should not be any technology holding you back. It's just a matter of getting out there and doing it, getting your hands a little bit dirty. But that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is visual storytelling? What do I mean by that? Well, if you look on Wikipedia, they have a very long definition here. A story told primarily through the use of visual media. The story may be told using photography, illustration, video, can be enhanced with graphics, music, voice, and other audio. And I'm like, eh, all right, that, that is a definition. Um, to me, it's a little boring uh, and not enough bullet points. If you've ever seen me define something, I like to break a definition out into bullet points. So I came up with what I think is a better definition of visual storytelling and the one that we're going to use today. And that is the use of highly visual material that highlights your organization's impact by emotionally engaging your audience and encouraging them to spread the word and take action. So that's it. There's a lot of words in there. So let's break down why this is this important and kind of the things we need to think about when we're telling our visual stories. First one is visual material. Obviously, it has to be visual. Uh, photos are great. We're going to talk about why video is even better. Next, it shows impact. Impact is what your donors, what your supporters want to see. They want to see, are you making a difference in the community? I gave you some money. What did you do with it? Did it make a difference in someone's life? Well, a story is the best way to show that impact. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. Emotionally engaging. This is where the visual really comes in. When people see things, hear things, um, you know, it, it activates more of their senses. It has been proven to pull in your emotion. Emotion is what then encourages action. And, of course, that is what we want with all of this. We can, you know, we don't want just a beautiful video out there that somebody shares on social media. We want them to then take action that develops a deeper relationship with us causes a donation, causes them to attend an event, all of that sort of stuff. So that's the definition that we're going to be using moving forward. So why visual storytelling? Well, visual storytelling is a very powerful thing. So we are hardwired to respond to visuals. Um, it started way back in the caveman days, so cave paintings. That's how they first started sharing information, and that goes all the way to today with television and movies. Okay, We are visual creatures. Uh, you know, there's a reason our eyes are as powerful as they are because we are visual. So there's, there's real, uh, you know, physical reasons there. Secondly, for me, there is huge competition to get attention online today. There are, you know, 8 billion trillion websites out there. Everyone's on social media, all this stuff. And if you want to get above that noise, um, you need to do more than written content. Written content is just not getting the attention. So if you want to get above that noise, you want to be using visual material. And finally, it's exactly what people want. Okay, photos and videos are shared five to ten times more than written content, right? When's the last time you got a Facebook message saying, oh, you have to go read this really long blog post. It's awesome, right? That's not what people share. People share images. People share videos, things that are really visually appealing and have emotion tied to them. It's also what your donors want. Seventy-four percent of donors said that they want more stories from the nonprofits that they support. So that's some of the reasons. But it gets even more powerful. Visuals are so much easier to understand. You've probably heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's actually much more than that. There's a great book you can find on Amazon called The Power of Visual Storytelling. Now, they really don't focus on nonprofits in that book. It's mostly businesses focused on visual storytelling. But there are some amazing lessons that you can pull out of there. I, I love this book. they got really beautiful examples of people doing visual storytelling. And one of the, one of the stats they have in there is that the human brain processes visuals 
60,000 times faster than text. Now that sounds kind of crazy, right? You're like 60,000 times. What does that even mean, right? So this means, so let me, let's do a little experiment right here, a little thought experiment. So if I told you there is a shape, it has four sides, it has four right angles, all of the sides, sides are equal in length, and it has a solid fill color of dark purple, right? You can probably imagine that in your head, right? But that took me a little while to get there. What if instead I just did that? Instantly, you know it's a purple square, right? I didn't have to use all those words to explain it. So that's the power of visuals, is instead of making people think, they see it, they know it, they understand it right away, and that helps us then get into that emotional element, okay? Viewers spend 100% more time on web pages with videos, and you'll see that if you look at your Google Analytics. If you put a video up on a blog post, go look in your Google Analytics for how long people stayed on that page. Google Analytics calls it average time on page. Um, I do this all the time. I put a video up, I go look at it. A regular blog post on our website gets about a minute, maybe two minutes of uh, uh, average time on page if we're lucky. If I have a video up there, um, it gets five, six, seven minutes of average time on page because people will spend more time on that page. If you get them to spend more time, they're more likely to then um, you know, go on and take other actions, especially if you ask them. So my last evidence of visual storytelling is a little bit story about me. So I, I obviously want you to remember me when we leave this webinar, so maybe you'll attend some of my other webinars, you know, engage on my email list, all of that great stuff. So I can sit up here and I can tell you that I'm a nice hockey player, right? And you're like, okay, that might be memorable. I'm an ice hockey player who lives in Austin, Texas, who's originally from California. Interesting fact, but it's not going to tell you much. Now, if I get a little more visual with you and I tell you, uh, people can tell I'm a hockey player because I've had both of my front teeth smashed out by a hockey stick, right? So that's getting a little more memorable. You probably have a little bit of a visual um, in your head, um, and that's not that big a deal. But I can tell you a story now. Of I was about to hop on a plane in about 24 hours about to hop on a plane to go speak at a conference. And I was really excited. I really wanted to uh, go speak at this conference. I, was, uh, I think I was doing a keynote for that one, so I was going to be in front of a lot of people. It was great. So right before I got on the plane, uh, something happened. I actually uh, actually hit a bottle um, on one of my teeth that had been uh, broken by that, that hockey stick, and boom, half the tooth knocked out um, into, my, into my hand. And I was like, oh, boy, what am I going to do? I panicked a little bit. I got some crazy glue, and I, I jammed it in there, and we kind of fixed it. Um, but then right before I was leaving for the plane, it got knocked out again. And so I basically kind of looked like this. Um, now, if you're going to go to <laughs> speak at a conference and you're going to talk about technology, that is probably not the look that you want to go with. Uh, not many people are going to take me seriously uh, if I'm missing a, a, a tooth there. Um, and so now, hopefully, with that visual story uh, around it, you know, maybe you will be more likely to remember me as the hockey player with no tooth that uh, speaks at conferences. Now, when I do this live, um, I can actually take my tooth out now. So sometimes when I'm up on stage live, I will actually take out my tooth, um, and then people definitely remember that. I will get comments uh, years later of people talking about uh, me taking out that, that, that tooth. So that is the power of visual storytelling. So now let's get into how we can actually do visual storytelling much better. And so what I say with visual storytelling, you need to focus on what I call the big three. There's big three areas that we're going to focus on, and when you combine these, it becomes a very powerful force. So we're going to start with our raw materials. Our raw materials are our stories, and we're going to talk about the stories and how to collect them and how to tell better stories, so that's great. A lot of people do written stories, right? We want to take it to that next level. We want to take that raw material and take it to the factory, which is going to be video, and the video is going to take that video and make it so much more powerful than that written word than just those raw materials. From there, we need a way to share it. We need a way to get it out there to distribute it, so we're going to do that with social media. And if we put all of these things together, it really does become a superhero. And you'll start to see tons of more engagement on your social media. You'll see more engagement on your website. You'll have more comments in your blog posts. You'll have more people emailing you back saying they love that story. It's all the things that they're looking for. So now let's jump in and start with the first one, stories uh, or the raw material. So why stories? Why are stories so powerful? Well, when you tell stories, something different happens. Something different happens in people's heads, hearts, physiology, and relationships, okay? It actually can physically change us listening to stories. But it also gets into our heads as well. So stories are more memorable. They get attention, okay? There's a cool study that they do where they take uh, people in a room, uh, they tell them 10 facts, and then they tell them a story. They call them up three months later, 
and ask them to recite the information. On average, people can remember three of the facts, but every single person can remember the story. So if you want people to remember you, if you want people to remember what you do and why it's important, you want to tell them a story. Beyond that, we're actually hardwired for stories. Okay, there's another study that they do where they hook two people up to brainwave machines, you know, got electrodes coming out of their head and all that stuff, and they measure their brain activity. They have one person tell a story, and they have one person just listen to that story. Within about four seconds, the brain activity in both people is identical. Your brains actually sync when you're telling or listening to a story, okay? So literally hardwired for that, all right? And then that leads to probably the most important aspect of stories, and that is that stories create an emotional connection. Okay, there's a great book by Dan O'Reilly, I believe is how you say his last name. He's a professor at Duke University. Um, he wrote this book called Predictably Irrational. I highly recommend putting it on your Amazon list if you, if you don't already uh, have it or have, have read it. Um, and he does a lot of human experiments where he says, people say they'll do this, but when, I, when we actually test them and put them in that environment, they actually do the polar opposite. And one of the studies he does on is he does studies on people making buying decisions. Okay, and I think donation decisions are exactly the same. It's actually taking out money and giving it to somebody else for a reason. And what he found is that people, when they're making buying decisions, they use emotion to make the decision, and they use rational facts to justify it later. Okay, so if we want people to donate more, if we want people to volunteer more, if we want them to attend our events, we need to focus on the emotion first, and then give them all the reasons why they made a good decision after that fact. If you lead with rational, if you lead with rational reasons like you know nine out of ten and ninety-seven percent of every dollar and all these facts and figures, you actually engage the wrong part of the brain. You engage the rational part of the brain. The rational part of the brain is going to cover up the wallet and say, "I can't donate today because you know I got a bill due, and you know maybe I should hold off and wait." And it's got all these rational reasons. So instead, we want to focus on that emotion. The stories, the video is going to help us do that. And then after that, we follow up and we let them know why they made a good decision by following up and telling them the impact that we made, okay? So that's what we want to do is focus on that emotion. Visual storytelling helps us do exactly that. So a great example of this, using emotion, right? So food banks. So I've done a lot of work with Feeding America over the last year and a half. Um, so I talked to a lot of food banks. I actually look at a lot of food bank websites, more food bank websites than I ever thought I'd look at in my entire life. And in the past, many food bank websites would look something like this. They would have pictures of food, they would have pictures of people packing up food and delivery vans, and they would show the warehouse and all this stuff, and they would have all these stats all over the website, 14,000 blah blahs, 12,456 blah 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 blahs. And I can tell you that's exactly what your supporters are reading when they read all those stats that you guys are, are, are throwing up there, okay? Instead, uh, the local food bank here, at the time it was the uh, Austin Food Bank, it's now the Central Texas Food Bank, but this is a campaign that they had a few years ago that I thought was so powerful because it involved stories, okay? Here it is. Yes, this is the face of hunger in Central Texas. It shows a homeless person with a sign, and so is this, and it shows this little girl looking right into the camera. Now, can you see the power of a story here? When you tell the story um, of little six-year-old Marie who was getting bad grades in school and uh, was getting in trouble all the time, and she couldn't focus, she couldn't pay attention, right? Turns out her family had food scarcity issues, they started coming to the food bank. She started getting three square meals a day. Now here's a quote from her teacher saying she's a joy to have in class. Um, you know, she's getting better grades. She, she can pay attention more. It's just she's a totally different little kid, okay? That tells me why a food bank is important, why I should support a food bank in, in my community. It's not food necessarily giving it to people. It's actually changing their lives and doing everything about it. See, that, that's where a story comes in to really teach me what a food bank is. Um, instead of just what I have in, in the back of my head. So that's why we want to focus on stories. And finally, why stories? Because it's exactly what your donors want to hear about. So the Community Philanthropy 2.0 survey asked donors, what do you want from the, you know, what do you want to hear about from the nonprofit you support? Number one thing they want to hear about, organizational impact. Number two thing, success stories. The best way to show organizational impact, guess what, is with success stories. So basically, if you do success stories, you do more stories about people that have succeeded in your programs or are doing well after you engaging with them, you're going to be giving them the top two things they care the most about. So start telling stories everywhere. The next thing is a lot of clients will start asking me, well, how do we get these stories? Where do we go to get them? 
I say you start collecting them anywhere and everywhere by all means necessary, and the best way to do this is just start asking for them, okay? Your next staff meeting, ask everybody to write down their favorite story about why they work at the organization. Every single staff member is going to have a story. Ask your clients, ask your donors, ask your sponsors. Um, ask anyone that is affiliated, volunteers, anyone affiliated with your organization, ask them for their stories and just start collecting them. If you have a binder full of stories, if you have a folder on your computer full of stories, you will never run out of content, okay? You can use those stories in in-person meetings, in emails, in phone calls, at events and presentations, in your annual reports. And then make your annual report come alive by not just reporting on what you did, but then having a story for every single program a story for every single staff that you have in your annual report. You can even use it in budgeting. You definitely can use it in grant writing. Can you see how stories can just be used everywhere and how powerful they are? So we definitely want to be doing more of that. Next thing is how to tell a better story. Okay, that's, and that's the other thing my, my clients get stuck on is they'll be like, okay, so we want to do more stories, yay, but how do I do it? You know, I got this person, Mary, and yeah, she's doing really great here kind of thing. So we want to dig into how to tell a better story. Well, the first thing is, is always, Start with the why and always be thinking about the why. If you can get your supporters to buy into the why you do what you do, they are much more likely to follow up and take action. Okay, you notice I started with the why our story is important because the why is that vital. And really, any why will help. Okay, there's a really cool study called the Xerox study. Back in 1973, um, they first did this study. And they go to a college campus. Um, they have a long line for the copy machine and they have someone try to cut in front of the line. If the person goes up and tries to cut in front of the line, says, can I cut in line, 60% um, of people let them cut in line. Okay, now that number's probably high because that was 1972, hippy dippy free love, all of that sort of good stuff, right? So maybe that number would be a lot lower now. But if he used the word because, if he had a reason he was cutting in line, 93% of people let him cut in line. And that was not even a good reason. His because was because I need to make a copy. Okay, so just having any sort of reason why is going to increase people wanting to comply with that. Okay, so we want to have a why. We know why a why is important. It can make that much dramatic of a difference, just having a why you do what you do. But what you really want to do is create a much better why. And there's a great TED Talk by Simon Sinek. It's called Why is Compelling and Gets Action. It's basically uh, the great leaders use, use, use why. I can't remember the exact name of the video, but look up Simon Sinek TED Talk, and I guarantee you it'll be the first one. It's one of the most popular TED Talks out there. And in it, Simon Sinek talks about how great leaders think differently, they talk differently. They use the why to get people to take action. Okay, it's not the what or the how that gets people to take action, it's the why. And he uses a great example there of Martin Luther King. So Martin Luther King on the steps of the Lincoln Monument didn't have a how or a what speech. He didn't say, oh, I think we should organize by state and then by district. We should have four district reps for every thing, and I think we should do door to door. Like, it wasn't tactical. He wasn't talking about all the things of how to do it, right? What did he talk about? He talked about the why. He talked about having a dream of kids playing together, right? And that why motivated people to go home and then do the how and the what. Okay, so it's that why. I highly recommend watching that TED Talk and really thinking through how you're communicating and instead focusing on the why instead of the what and how. Because I can tell you, your what and how that you do is probably similar to other nonprofits out there. That's not going to make you stand out. But if you have an amazing why, if you use stories to show the why you do what you do, that's going to make you stand out uh, against your, you know, quote unquote competition. All right, so some other things to craft better stories. Highlight the visual and the emotional, okay? And this is why we're doing visual storytelling, because it does get on the emotion. So always be thinking about how to make your stories more visual, whether that's photos, video, using very descriptive text. Um, I'm a huge fan of photos and video, especially because think about when's the last time you cried reading a print ad, and when's the last time you cried watching a TV commercial? Much more likely that you teared up watching a TV commercial or a TV show, right? Because it just it involves more of the senses. It paints a vivid picture. It really pulls you in, sucks you in. So we want to highlight that. Another really interesting thing that came out from some of Dan O'Reilly's uh, experiments that he's done is individual stories are more powerful. Okay, so he did a, a, a study with a malaria organization, and they sent out two sets of emails. The first set of emails focused on malaria as a large problem, how many countries and how many millions of people um, are affected, and malaria is this disease, and they're really talking about it as this big kind of aggregate problem, right? And they raised X amount of dollars. 
Well, the next set of emails they send out were all stories about individuals affected by malaria um, and how it all could have been avoided uh, if they just had bed nets. And particularly, stories about children were very effective on this. Donations went up four times, 4x increase in donations by telling stories about individuals. And the reason for that is a story about an individual really helps me understand what malaria is, why it's a big issue, and what the organization is doing to actually make an impact on that. I, I, I just, it all makes much more sense with an individual story instead of talking about these aggregate numbers. I can also feel like I, I can make a difference in one person's life. I don't feel like I can make a difference in 1.5 million people's lives that are affected by malaria across the whole world, right? That's a little too, too much. But if I tell an individual story, I go, God, you know, I could give 50 bucks, and if that buys 10 bed nets, um, I could help, you know, 10 little girls just like Marie. You, you know what I mean? That's where it gets powerful. So we're telling those individual stories. We also want to utilize more of the senses. So a big thing with storytelling, and you'll hear writers talk about this all the time, stories don't tell, they show. You don't say the character was happy, the character was sad, blah, blah, blah. You give more emotion, give more of the five senses. You know, if you're talking about sadness, you know, her eyes started, started welling up with tears, getting, you know, red. You could tell that first tear was going to fall out any moment. Like, doesn't that paint a much big, better picture for you than me just saying she cried, right? So really thinking about how to utilize all five of those senses, setting things in a time and place. The more detail you can give in your stories, the more likely people are going to get sucked in. Once they get sucked in, what happens? It engages their emotional part of their brain, and they're going to be much more likely to then take the action that we want them to do. Next one is audiences bore easily. Um, so we want to hook them early. Um, we, we can't start with too many facts. We can't start with a long, boring intro. We want to just hit them right away with the action. And James Bond movies does this really well, right? James Bond, it always starts with action, um, jumps right in. Next one is use the cliffhanger. This is one of my favorite, favorite storytelling devices. If you want to get more engagement on your next email, if you want to get more engagement on your next social media post um, or your next direct mail piece or anything like that, don't finish a story. Let there be a cliffhanger, right? And I know cliffhangers work um, because I was sucked into cliffhangers. When I was 13 years old, I was hooked on the show General Hospital. Yes, 13-year-old boy, hooked on General Hospital. Now, in my defense, this was the good years of General Hospital. This was Luke, Laura, Scorpio, stuck on the island trying to get off, all that stuff. How did I get hooked on General Hospital? It was summer. My mom's watching it. I come into the room because I'm bored out of my mind. We don't have the Internet back then. Um, and I see her watching this, and I start making fun of it. I'm like, look at that. The plants are fake. Those are obviously potted plants. The costumes are horrible. The acting is horrible. And all of a sudden, they throw up to be continued, right? And I'm like, whoa, what do you mean to be continued? They're going to tell me how that ends? She says, no, no, you got to tune in tomorrow. Suddenly, I am sucked into the story. I'm watching General Hospital all summer long. Uh, luckily, uh, it comes on at 2 p.m. where I used to live, and uh, when school started, I was weaned off of that. I, I, uh, I didn't watch it anymore. But the cliffhanger is super powerful. So now really quickly, I'm going to give you three types of stories that you can start telling today. And we're not going to spend too much time on these, but when you, when you get the slides, you'll, you'll be able to go these a little bit more. The first type of story is the success story. We talked earlier. It's the number two thing that, that your supporters want from the Community Philanthropy 2.0 study. This is just basically a story that highlights somebody in your program, uh, person, animal, environment, whatever it is, and it being successful. People love to see somebody winning, somebody being a success, and, and they can see that if I donate, I can also be part of those successes, right? So we want to be telling success stories. They're the number one way to start, for sure. The next is the why we do what we do. Um, and this is basically what would happen if you're not there? Um, what would happen if you weren't there to help all the people that, that, that you do? It's kind of combined with the success stories. Um, go, you know, watching the Simon Sinek video, you can dig a little more into that why, but talking about the why, all right? And finally, this is the easiest one to really start with, is just grabbing the favorite stories from other people. I mentioned it earlier. Ask your staff, ask your board, ask your donors, your volunteers. Ask them for their favorite stories. And one of the easiest ways to do is we're going to talk about video next, but it's just grabbing your phone, recording them, telling their favorite story, and you pretty much have a video of a story, and that is going to be more compelling. So we'll talk about that as we get into the next section now. And that is we're going to now move to the factory. And the factory is where we're going to start doing some video. So why do we want to focus on the video? First of all, it's more affordable and easier than ever. You don't need fancy equipment anymore. You basically grab the phone that we all have in our pockets. I'm holding my phone right here. You hit record on the thing, and you ask someone their favorite story. You record it. 
you post that on YouTube, you put it on your blog, I guarantee you that blog post is going to get more engagement than any of your previous written sort of long sort of written posts. It's more effective, it's more engaging. Uh, social media, which we're going to talk about next, it's all about video. What gets shared on social media? Video, 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 cat videos. I mean, talk about a rage. People love videos. It's also the best way to tell your story. Visual storytelling, we, you know, just having a short video, it does not have to be fancy. So let's get into some of those video tips, because I know video freaks people out a lot. They're like, oh, we can't do video, I don't want to be on camera, and I don't know how to do all this stuff. So let's give you some quick video tips. First one is don't buy expensive equipment. You could totally use your phone. In fact, we're seeing anecdotally that those handheld phone videos are actually getting more engagement than highly professional, polished sort of videos. Um, people love the sort of in the moment type video of, oh, we were just, we were talking, we wanted to record this amazing story that we just heard, um, and you record it. People feel like they're behind the scenes at that point. It's just, it comes across as more real and more authentic. The next big tip is keep it short. If you look at YouTube usage statistics, including some studies out there on video length, at about two minutes, attention just drops off a cliff. People just stop paying attention after two minutes, and that's probably because we're all trained by cat videos. Um, and all of that good stuff, um, but they do fall off. So if you have a story that's longer than two minutes, uh, guess what we can do? We can use a cliffhanger. So we can keep part one under two minutes and then say, you know, tune in tomorrow for the exciting conclusion of the story of Marie. And then the next day, you can post the next one. Email it out, post it on social media, whatever you want to do. Make it a cliffhanger. Break it up. Um, use that to your advantage. The next one is to keep it focused on one main point. We want to tell one story in each video. We don't want to tell 10 stories. People are going to get start to get confused on it. We don't want to have 15 points to make. We want to have one main point that leads into one of the most important things that people forget to put in a video, and that is a call to action. We don't want people to just watch our videos. That is not our goal. Our goal is to get them to take an action, to volunteer, to sign up for our email list, to donate, to attend an event, et cetera, right? So every video should have a call to action at the end. If you like to hear success stories like this, sign up on our email list below. If you like to hear success stories like this, donate today and you can help five other kids just like Marie. Give them that strong call to action at the end of all of your videos and make that action right below the video, whether that's a donate button, an email subscription, whatever that is. That is the goal of our video. Now you want to get into creating a successful video you know, you want to get a lot more deep into it. We can do planning, production, editing, hosting. You can really dig deep into all of this. I'll just give you a couple high-level tips, um, and then I, I have a, a worksheet that I could probably send over to Abby that you guys could use when you're trying to think through your uh, video. But, you know, planning, think about what's your story, what's your message, and most important, what's your call to action going to be. When you get to the production phase, kind of plan the shoot. Think about what you want to do. A lot of people do storyboarding. I don't think you have to do that much, but at least think through, I want to get a shot of this and then a shot of that. Um, we can go and edit that later. So just kind of think through that. And then the editing. The editing really freaks people out. Don't worry about it. Um, one, you don't have to edit it. Um, if you make it, if you just say, hey, I just grabbed my phone today. I wanted to record the story. You tell people right up front that this is a phone video and I'm not going to be editing it. That is totally fine. Like I said, a lot of those uh, are actually more authentic and people really identify with them. But if you want to get into easy video editing, there are free programs you can get on your computer. Uh, the Mac has iMovie. Uh, the PC has Windows Movie Maker. Both of those can be, uh, I think the I iMovie already comes on all Macs. Um, Windows Movie Maker, I think you have to download it, but it's free to download online. Then you can get more advanced on stuff. And hosting, don't let hosting trip you up. Use YouTube. Uh, I use YouTube for all of our videos. I use YouTube for client videos for two big reasons. One, it's easy to use. I basically upload whatever video I pulled off my phone to YouTube. They give me a little embed code. I can then embed that directly on my website. So they are going to host the video. It's up to them to keep it up and running. All I'm doing is getting the benefit of the video on my own website, and that is the key, too. You always want to put it on your own website. Don't link people directly to YouTube. You don't want them over on YouTube getting distracted by related videos um, on the side. We want them to actually stay on our website and uh, pay attention. And finally, on the online video tips, you want to get better at video, you got to do more video. There is no way to get better at video without doing videos. I will guarantee you right now your first videos are going to be horrible, okay? You are not going to be happy with them. You are not going to like them. But the only way to get through it is to keep doing more videos. So you just keep practicing, keep practicing. Watch others. Imitate what others are doing. If you see another nonprofit doing a cool style of video, go ahead and try and do it yourself. You don't copy their content, but you can copy their style, the idea that they had of, of doing the video. You know, It's always better to borrow 
and to try and come up with original ideas. There's also some resources that will teach you how to do better video. Uh, Wistia.com has an online library of things about how to get better at video, but basically just get out there and do more video. Okay? So those are the video tips. Nothing earth shattering. I do not want to get too deep into video because if we, if we go down that rabbit hole, you guys won't do it. You'll be like, oh, I got to learn more about lighting and I got to learn more about camera angles and I got to learn more about this. No, you don't. Get out there and just start doing videos. That is how you get better at them. And I guarantee if you follow the steps we talked about here, you will see more engagement um, on those videos. All right. So now we're jumping into social media, sort of our distribution channel. Um, and as I said, I'm not a huge fan of social media. I don't like doing social media myself. I usually don't recommend my clients spending too much time on social media because the ROI, the return on investment is usually not there. However, visual stories do really well on social media because what it's exactly what people want. They want visuals, they want stories, they want video. Those are the type of things that you should spend some time doing on social media um, because they are going to get more engagement. So why social media? Tons of reasons why you want to be using social media for your stories in your video. Social loves visual content, 12 times more likely to be shared, more likely to go viral. Social really highlights the emotion and the story. If you can get people commenting on your stories, it makes it more likely that others will see it. It makes it more likely that others will comment, will do something. You get, you know, you have a great story you told on video. Someone comments below about their story that they were reminded of because of that. It starts to really build upon itself, okay? Social and video are pretty much joined at the hip. I mean, YouTube has become its own social channel now. Uh, you can subscribe to someone's YouTube channel. You can comment. You can share. You can do all these things that you used to only be able to do on social media. You can now do that there. And, of course, you can share video all over, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of that crazy stuff, right? I also heard a really interesting speaker. It was a, it was a panel of news reporters um, at a nonprofit conference that I went to in Idaho. And there was a woman there, Anna Webb, from the Idaho Statesman, um, and she, she basically said, she, gets, she said, I get like a thousand press releases a day faxed to me. I don't have time to go through that because there's just too many of it. It's too overwhelming. So she basically ignores press releases that come in. What she would rather do is go find videos that are out there and starting to get attention. If she sees a video that's starting to go viral, she'll use that as an idea for her next story. So if you want a reporter to pay attention to you, I would suggest try this new form of press release, as Anna Webb said, and send, it, send an email to a reporter saying, hey, just wanted you to see this video that we shot. Uh, we're really starting to get some uh, action on this. People are really loving this story, right? Would a reporter want to write a story about something that they know people are interested in or something they think people might be interested in, right? They're going to go for a known quantity. So if you can show them it's already getting attention, it's already getting traction, that maybe they want to jump in on this too probably going to have a better shot of getting it. And this Anna Webb, uh, reporter woman, basically said, that's what I look for, and those are the people that I'm doing stories on. So just a little tidbit there. Also a great way to engage with millennials. So I know we're all trying to engage better with millennials. Well, millennials engage in a different way than all of the other uh, generations out there. And you can read more about this uh, Millennial Impact Report usually goes really deep into this every year. Um, this was a couple years ago they had this graphic where they talked about how millennials prefer to learn about nonprofits, okay? They don't call, call you up. Uh, they don't wait for your face-to-face uh, -face meeting. You can see only 18% uh, and 17% uh, go for print or face-to-face -face meetings to learn about a nonprofit. What they do is they go to your website, 65%. They don't really go there for much except to grab your social media profiles. Most millennials believe that your website is kind of corporate speak gobbledygook type stuff. And they're like, eh, I want to actually see what people are talking about. So they grab your social media profiles, they jump over to your social media. Then they want to see what you do there. If you have the same content on your social media as you have on your website, they're probably gone. Because what they're really looking for on your social media is personality. They're looking for real voices, real people having conversations, less organization speak. And actually, it's also better if you have more than one person posting and not posting by the organization name, but actual real people posting and having conversations. If they see conversations happening there, they may post and ask some questions. And the next step for them is not to donate to an organization. Their next step is to volunteer. So what we're seeing is that millennials prefer to volunteer first. And if the volunteering goes well, then they are more likely to donate. Most other organizations do it the other way around, or most other generations do it the other way around. They donate, and then maybe they'll volunteer 
um, down the road. So just an interesting way to engage with millennials using that social media, using those visual stories, engaging with them on platforms that they're comfortable uh, engaging with. So now I know what you guys are thinking. Social media, you've been doing social media for a while, you're not getting any engagement, you'll put up a post on Facebook and you'll get maybe one like on it and you're, no one's talking and because there is a big problem with social media um, and that is how to get above the noise. There is so much noise out there with social media, there's so many posts, there's so many people following and blah, 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 all of this stuff, how do you get above the noise, right? So first of all, we're all flooded with all these inputs, blah, blah, blah. And to make it even worse, I just forgot to mention this, Facebook is actually making it harder for you to get your message out there. You probably remember back in the golden days of Facebook, if you had a thousand Facebook page fans, like they called them fans back then, now it's people who like your page. If you had a thousand people that were following your Facebook page, you would send out a post and it would go to like almost all of them, 800 people. And oh my gosh, you come back, you get all these comments. Well, Facebook implemented a thing called edge rank. Uh, back a while ago, a couple years now, and they've been tweaking this edge rank algorithm to make it so it's very, very hard for you to get engagement. You probably noticed this. Now if you post something on Facebook, um, it'll get shown to like 10 people. And if those 10 people don't comment or share it or do something, that post is dead. They stop sharing that post. If someone comments or likes it, then they'll share it with another 20 people. If someone comments or likes it, they'll share it with another 50 or 60 or 100. But you have to get engagement on those posts or Facebook is not going to share it. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. You know, Facebook says they're doing it because they only want to, to push out content that people are interested in, and so that's why they're doing it. Others say they're doing it to force you to buy ads, to pay to have your stuff shared, pay to boost, and we're gonna talk about that later. Um, but there are some good tips I'm gonna give you in a little bit here about how to break EdRank, how to, how to get past EdRank, how to get around EdRank, how to maybe give Facebook what they want, um, but not have, have you spend an arm and a leg. So we'll talk more about that. So how do we get above the noise? Some basic things you can do. Number one is post amazing content and vary it. So what I mean by amazing content is exactly what we're talking about today, visual storytelling. So stories and videos might be a great idea, right? The other thing, though, is to vary your content. If you only post the same type of content, if you only post videos, Facebook may stop sharing your stuff with your followers because that's starting to look like a bot. That's starting to look like not a real person. Real people don't just share one type of content, right? And so Facebook's algorithm is always looking for things that look a little suspicious. So if you always share the same type of content, the same length, everything, they might get a little suspicious. So we wanna share uh, a question, uh, share a poll, share a video, share a story, share a short post, share a link to your latest blog post, share different types of content varying it around. And the second big tip I had is try posting at odd hours. So I find most of the clients that I, when I talk to them, they are sharing content Monday through Friday from nine to five, because that's when they happen to be in the office, right? Well, a lot of the people who follow you, they're also in the office at those times. A lot of places don't allow their employees to go on Facebook. They block Facebook, they block YouTube, all of that stuff, so they can't even go see it. So start experimenting by posting at odd hours. You can try posting on lunch break during the week. That's a kind of good time. People go out to their car, uh, they get, grab their bag lunch, they get on their phone and they start doing Facebook and all that stuff. So that might be a good time to post because they're more likely to see it. But also try posting at really odd times like evenings and weekends. Okay, we have had clients that have seen so much better engagement on the evenings and the weekends that they hardly ever post Monday through Friday, nine to five anymore. Because people are at home in the evenings and the weekends, they're on Facebook, they're doing all their social media, they're in front of the TV with their iPad, doing Facebook while they watch you know, TV shows, whatever it is they're much more likely to engage, they're much more likely to see it during that time. So start experimenting around, and you don't have to be there live to post. You can use software to schedule your post. You can use something like Buffer. Uh, Buffer.com is a software that I use where I can schedule my post. I can say, here's a post I wanna share on Facebook and share it at 8 p.m. tonight, or share it at 8 p.m. next Wednesday. You can load 10 messages in there and have them shared for you whenever you want, so you don't have to actually do it physically. So start using some of those um, some of those software, some of those tools around. And Buffer has a free version, so you can use the free version of uh, Buffer to share, I think, up to 10 scheduled posts um, you can have in, 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 in your queue. So those are some basics, but let's talk about some real good strategies now about how to get above the noise. I got five more distribution strategies, and these are, can be specifically used with videos and stories to share on social media and get the attention. Because remember, that's what people want to 
watch. That's what people want to share. So think about that as we're going through these five distribution strategies. The first one is the basics. So what I say is start where you are uh, or pick the right networks. Don't try to be on every social media network out there. Pick one or two that make the most sense for your organization. I would say for most people, that's going to be Facebook. For most nonprofits, Facebook has the best engagement. Um, you know, if you have a younger audience, maybe Twitter uh, or, or Instagram, you know what I mean? If you, uh, if you have a very visual cause, then Pinterest might be a good one for you, but you kind of have to decide what it is. But start with one or two networks maximum and really get good at those before you start trying to do all of them. The next big tip is encourage engagement. When you're posting things, ask people to share. Just like we said, videos have to have a call to action. All of your social media posts should also have a call to action. Watch this video, and then if you love to share it with your friends, tell them what to do. Um, and also remember, social media should be a conversation. Okay, you don't want to be that guy at the networking reception who only talks about himself. Me, me, me. Hey, did I mention me, right? That's what many nonprofits do on social media. It's like, hey, donate to us. Hey, we have an event coming up. Hey, did you read our latest blog, blog post? Hey, me, 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 right? We turn into me, me, me. Have a conversation. Ask them questions. Go and post on other people's uh, pages and walls talking about your cause, and, and, et cetera, all right? Make it a conversation. Once you have that down, one of my big social media tips I like to do is to help my clients create what I call a social media army or a social media team. Um, now, this isn't people you hire to be on your team. This is people who already love what you do, okay? This could be staff, board members, volunteers, family members, whoever it is. Get them to share your posts and video. Get them to like and comment on your posts. This increases engagement. This helps you get around the edge rank because uh, we're getting real people to share real content, and we're not paying them to do it. It's not, it's not shady. What we're doing is we're giving them the resources to easily share content. So a great example of this, something I highly recommend you do, the next time you have a video that you want to post on social media, what you do is before you post it, you send an email out to your social media army or your social media team. This could be 10 people, 20 people, 50 people, however many people you have on it. And you say, in five minutes, we are posting our video, our latest video. It's an amazing story. One, we want you to go watch it. But two, we really need you to share it so it can get out there and get more people to see it. You go post it. You send the email. People see it. They go click on it. They go watch it on Facebook. They like it. They share it. That is then going to say, Facebook's going to go, oh, this is an interesting post. People are engaging. They're commenting. We're going to share it with more people, okay? The other thing you can do, provide some incentives and thank yous. Like I said, you don't want to pay people to do this because that gets a little on the shady side. But you can say, hey, anyone who's a member of our social media army, our social media team, they're going to get a free T-shirt. They're going to get a free invitation to our barbecue and, and, and pups lunch, you know, whatever it is. Give them some incentives to want to be on this social media team, a special happy hour just for the social media team. You know, stuff like that, people are going to be more likely to want to do it. It gets to be fun. This is also a great way to engage with millennials, right? Millennials love social media. Let them organize your social media team um, and get them to help share. They have much more followers than most of us that are in the Gen X and above uh, uh, sort of crowds. Um, they, they know how all the, the networks work. Get them to help you to spread that word. Next is try running a contest. Um, so there's a couple ways you can run a contest. One, you can just say anyone who comments or likes this post we're going to pick a winner and they get a free t-shirt. That's a real simple way to do it. But you can also use software out there. One of the ones I've used in the past is called Raffle Copter. Um, and this is an example of what a Raffle Copter contest looks like. It's Raffle, R-A-F-F-L-E, Copter, like a helicopter, Raffle Copter. Um, and what's great about Raffle Copter is people can enter the contest by taking action. So they enter the contest by following you on Twitter, by sharing something on Facebook, by telling a friend, by joining your email list. So you actually get them to engage and then when they engage, they get extra entries into the contest. So again, we're giving them a little bit of an incentive. It's a little more fun. They can you know, get entries, but we ask them to actually take action. And sharing a video, that is a great action. Sharing one of your favorite stories, things of that nature is a great thing to do. Now finally, maybe trying a boost. If you haven't tried to boost a post yet or don't even know what that is, you may want to look into it if you do it the correct way. So what a boost is is when you post something on your Facebook page now, you'll see a little button show up at the bottom of it saying, hey, would you like to boost this post? Now I don't recommend boosting all of your posts, but if I have a really good online video story that I just got, I might think about boosting that post. And the reason you want to do a boost is because it will automatically share it with more people. 
Now what's great about it is you can't just say, yeah, share this with all my followers and it'll boost it for five bucks, it'll send it out to all of your followers. Okay, that's good. But you can get so much more granular with Facebook boost if you say, I want to select my own target audience, my own target audience. You can get a lot more specific. You can say, share with my followers and their friends. So it's followers. If someone's following you uh, or, or likes your page, they probably have friends that would also like it, so it'll share it with them as well. So you can even get more specific into it. You can get so specific that you can get down into their age, whether they're men or women, other pages that they like. And this is something I will do. I will boost a post sometimes when I'm going to go speak in a town. So there's an example on the screen here where I was going to go speak at the Idaho nonprofit conference, and I wanted people to come and stop by my booth. So I started sharing a post uh, on Facebook saying, you know, come and see me, and, you know, you can get, you know, win a free consulting session, blah, blah, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. But then I only shared it with people in Idaho, age 30 to 55, who had interests that were related to nonprofits. So nonprofit organizations, nonprofits, nonprofits on Facebook, they like nonprofit type stuff. So that, that ad or that post was only shown to people exactly who I wanted it to be shown to. Okay? That can get really powerful. So if you're an animal organization, you can only show it to people that, that like rescue uh, organizations or are a foster, uh, you know, foster family themselves, things of that nature. You can get very granular. And of course, in all of these, if you boost something, it better have a call to action. If I see you boost something, and you don't have a call to action in it, I'm going to come down to your office and, and tell you why you're doing everything wrong. We want to have a call to action, especially if we're going to pay to uh, get a boost. Finally, way to get above the social media noise, email. Don't forget email. I know, you know there's articles out there about email is dead, nobody's using email anymore. Nope, email is still the easiest way to get eyeballs on what you want to get it on immediately. Okay? Try post something on Facebook asking for a comment, right? And then send out an email to your email list asking people to reply and comment. Almost every time you will get more comments back via the email than you do on the social media post. Um, the inbox, while it's flooded, it is still not as noisy as social media. All right? So we want to think about that as well. So use that email. So next thing, a couple of examples I'm going to show you guys. And we won't spend a lot of time on these, um, but I'll, I'll, when you get the slides, you'll be able to go. I put URLs to all of these. I want to give you some examples of great video visual storytelling. First one is from the Rosebud Reservation Boys and Girls Club. This one was awesome. It was just a simple video from the heart. It's the exact type of video I'm talking about. They didn't have an expensive camera. They just walked up to people from the Rosebud Reservation and said, what does the Boys and Girls Club mean to you? And everyone tells heartfelt stories and statements about what the club meant to them. And that let you know why this club was important and why you should donate to support this club. Okay, Very simple one to do. Uh, the next one is getting user-generated stories. So if you have clients, if you have supporters, if you have users that could actually contribute their stories, that is another great way to go. So this was uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, they had all these pictures of kids from the Holocaust who were separated from their families back in 1939, right, uh, you know, uh, when the war was first getting started. So they started posting these pictures online saying, do you know these people? Do you remember me was their thing. And people start writing in and saying, oh, I think that's my dad. Um, his name is blah, blah, blah. And they would tell the story of how their dad got from 1939 Austria uh, to living in Poughkeepsie, New York, right? Pretty amazing. And the stories are so powerful. And like that tells you why the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum needs to exist like why it's important, the impact that it's making, and why you should support it, right? That's what gets into that why. And I think use of video on that would have made it even more engaged. I didn't see a lot of video on the ones that I looked at, but if they had a little handheld video of one of the people telling their story, that would have been even more powerful than the long uh, text posts they have. Next one, education and entertaining. Uh, this was a client I worked with in the past, uh, Campaign for Equal Justice. They are a legal aid organization. Um, and legal aid has a tough sell because, you know, you're basically trying to get people to donate and then people are like, wait, I'm going to give you money and you're going to give it to an attorney? No way, man. I hate attorneys. I don't like attorneys. Why do I want to give attorneys money? So they created a little video here and it was a Boyd Acapella group from Portland, Portland, Oregon, where they're from, and they sang a song called Do You Believe in Justice? And basically with the song, it explained what legal aid really was and what it meant to people's lives who were, who were affected by the legal system and couldn't get help. Stuff. So a kind of creative use of video. Another great food bank um, example here, the uh, uh, San Francisco Marin Food Bank has a whole page of stories to tell you what a food bank really is and why it's important. That's another great example. 
Another example is on the scene videos or interviews. And you can especially do these when you have conferences or you have meetings. If you have anyone that shows up to one of your conferences or meetings that has any sort of name recognition that people might be Googling, this is a great way to get some extra traffic to your website. So I did this for one of my clients, the Texas Association of Partners in Education. They had Representative Diana Maldonado came to speak at their conference. And so right as she was done speaking, we went out the hallway, we grabbed her, and we said, hey, uh, uh, Representative Maldonado, can we ask you a couple questions? I hit record on my phone, um, and uh, Serenity, one of the staff members there, interviewed her about what's happening in education now and, and how can an organization like TAPE uh, benefit uh, members and blah, blah, blah. We posted it up on YouTube, as you can see, and then we put it on the blog. And then we started getting traffic from people Googling Representative Maldonado. Google loves video. They're going to rank video really highly, a lot of times on the first page of Google almost immediately. Um, and we started getting people coming and wanted to hear what Representative Maldonado had to say, extra traffic to the website, extra notoriety, uh, et cetera. And finally, example is this one. I don't know if you've seen this one. This one is awesome. It's from Greenpeace. It's Marmot Licks GoPro. Um, and so this one, they hadn't planned this one. It just happened, but they ran with it, and it became a very powerful video. So what it is is they had set up a GoPro video up on this mountain um, looking over this valley, and they were doing one of those time-lapse videos. So they put the camera there. They left it there for like 24 hours. Um, and all they wanted to get was, you know, the clouds going by and the sun setting over the mountains. They were going to use it in, in a video. Well, what's really funny is when they got their camera back, it would have been knocked over, and they're like, what happened to this camera? So as they went back and looked at it, this little marmot um, walked up to the camera, was really intrigued by the camera, and started sniffing around it, looking at it, and all of a sudden he just starts licking the camera, right? So it's like, oh, no, this marmot ruined our shot. Well, if you go watch the video, Greenpeace did an amazing thing with this. One, they put the video up, um, and right as the marmot walks up, they slow it down to real time, and then you see the marmot sniffing around, and he licks it, and it's He's super cute. I mean, you can just look at him right there. He's super cute. And then at the end of it, they have a call to action. And they say, if you would like to help, you know, little guys like this marmot, uh, you know, won't you donate below? Um, they got tons of views. I mean, when I grabbed the screenshot, it was 2 million views. It's probably up over 3 million views uh, by the time you guys go look at it now. It went totally viral. They ended up getting a ton of donations from it. Um, but it was just an unexpected surprise moment that they actually turned into an amazing uh, experience. So great video to go check out. So your action steps. Um, I'm going to always remind you of this. If you've been on a webinar with me. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. That means you need to start doing visual storytelling now. You know, you should have done it five years ago. If you didn't, start doing it today. So of course, your homework. Commit to visual storytelling. I hopefully have convinced you why it's so powerful. It is actually going to make your job easier to tell more visual stories because people are going to engage more. Get your first story out there this week. Do whatever you can to get a story out there. If you will do it this week, um, those are the people that I see be really successful over time. I'll talk to them six months later. Um, those ones that got a video out that first week are the ones that are still doing it, still seeing amazing stuff, and they started to get better at video because they just kept putting it out there. All right? So select a few strategies, ideas, success. Figure out what you need help with. You know, we're definitely here to help. Uh, and, of course, take action. So the only plug I'll say, try some of the solutions. If you need help with any of this, if you need help with your website, uh, you know, email marketing, visual storytelling, any of that stuff, we are here to help. would love to talk to you guys more. And from there, we'll jump into the Q&A. I know we, I kind of went a little long there, Abby. I apologize for that. But, uh, uh, you know, let me know if we got any questions coming in or any questions you have. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, we definitely have a few. Um, some of them get right into the nitty gritty of standing out from the crowd. Uh, like you pointed out, everybody is trying to tell their story, but not everyone is doing it visually in ways that get people excited. So aside from using things like uh, video or pictures, uh, let's see, uh, Pamela Boykin asked how important hashtags are when trying to get your content out there. That's, that's, that's a good one. So, I mean, a hashtag um, obviously going to be a little more effective on Twitter. Um, I know people try to use hashtags on other social media channels. I haven't seen those work very well. Um, you know, I think hashtags can work. If, if you have a hashtag that people would be searching for, then it can help. But I see people make up hashtags all the time. And if someone's not searching for that or you haven't given them a reason to search for that, it's probably not going to help you very much. But I'll also give a grain of salt with that. I'm not a huge social media guy, so I don't really go really deep into social media. Um, so someone else might be able to answer that question better. But I haven't seen it make too much of a difference. I see a much bigger return on investment uh, by sharing it, asking for engagement, and then emailing out to let people know that it's out there to uh, go share it. I usually get more 
uh, more traction from that. Definitely. Um, if you aren't a social media fan, I get kind of nerdy about social media best practices. And uh, Pamela, I can tell you that hashtags can be really useful, but like Rich pointed out, it is better to tweet on a hashtag that already has activity on it, mm -hmm. unless you're doing something like an event or a campaign mm -hmm. where you have your own hashtag. And the caveat I'll throw in there is that if you do have your own hashtag and are trying to get momentum on that hashtag, that's where having the social media team gets really important. Um, one person using a hashtag isn't going to get a lot of attention, but if you can use other people's enthusiasm for your cause and ask them to use that hashtag and kind of spread the word around, you can get more traction that way. There's also a kind of related, but this is more of a Facebook question. Um, Pamela also asked, do you recommend groups or pages on Facebook for nonprofit organizations? Oh, that's a good one. You might be able to help me with that one, but I, I would say it, it depends what your goal is. Um, so pages are really good for uh, posting updates and maybe getting some engagement, whereas a group is much better for having uh, longer conversations. So think of a group as more having members of your group where a page is mm -hmm. more almost like a, a second website of your where you're posting content maybe. That's I mean that's that's what I've kind of seen. For sure. Um, groups are really useful, but I do know that a lot of people struggle with groups for this one reason. If someone joins a group, they automatically get notifications every time someone participates in that. So if someone comments or if someone um, makes a statement, people will get push notifications for that. Um, and depending, I mean, I know I spend a lot of time on Facebook and I get exasperated with tons of activity on groups just because I'll log in and have 85 uh, updates. The biggest thing to keep in mind is, um, like you said, groups are better for discussions and stuff. Pages are awesome for posting updates. But whatever you do, uh, don't set your nonprofit up as an individual user. Um, that's a mistake I see a yeah. lot of nonprofits make at first. And it, the, the difference is this. If you have a page, I can go and like it and automatically start getting updates when you post. If people make a Facebook page as a Facebook user or as an individual, I have to request to be friends with them. And uh, that that makes me not really want to engage. So yeah. both are useful, but never do an individual page. Uh, let's see, kind of along the, line, the same topic, uh, you were talking about Facebook's EdRank algorithm. Uh, is there an algorithm for Twitter? And if there is, how is it different from Facebook's? I don't know if there's a, an algorithm necessarily for Twitter. What I see in my Twitter feed is it's, it's just anyone I follow, it just dumps it into my feed. And like I almost never see anything on Twitter because it's just, you know, I got, I think I have 3,000 folks following me and then I'm, I'm following a lot of those folks back. So. Like when I look at my feed, it's just pure chaos. Um, you know, I just, I just think things just get dumped in there. Um, I'm much more likely to see uh, a Twitter post uh, from someone when they're whether they're talking about um, a certain topic or a post, and they do a hashtag, and I might go search that hashtag. Maybe, maybe I will see it then. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I don't spend a ton of time on on, on social media. How about you, Evan? Sure. Uh, that's kind of my same my same point. Uh, Anne is the one who asked that question. And the way Twitter works is a little, or it's pretty radically different from Facebook. Everything, it seems, is chronological. Um, yep. So the, the downside is that uh, it can often be hard to connect with large groups of people at one time, just because if you're tweeting, you're really connecting with the people who are on their Twitter feeds at that moment. Um, the upside is that there are hashtags, so if people are having larger conversations that you want to be a part of, it's really easy to interact with them that way. Uh, so that's where Twitter gets really useful. Um, if you are concerned about your reach on Twitter, I would try including one or two hashtags that relate to conversations that are already happening online. Yep. We do have a really great, wow, a great question. A great question about uh, infographics. Do you see them as a useful tool in visual storytelling, and how uh, successful do they tend to be? 
Most definitely. I'm a huge fan of infographics. Uh, we've done a couple for our clients lately. Uh, we've done a couple of websites where we built for clients and they wanted infographics, so we've done that for them. We found infographics to be a great visual storytelling tool. Um, and something we like to do with infographics is infographics help data come to life. So we had a client, uh, we worked with a, a, a city here uh, with us locally, their economic development department. Um, and their whole goal is to get other businesses to call them to want to move their business to, to this city. Um, and so we created an infographic that was all about the, the stats that were showing the city growing and all this stuff, and then with each stat, we had a little nugget of information to explain that. Um, and so that was one good one. I did another one with a domestic violence organization that specifically worked with uh, domestic violence for police families, because police families have some of the highest domestic violence rates um, in the country. And what we did is with every stat of the infographic, you could click on it and go read a story that kind of brought that stat to life. And so that could be linked to a video. We, we just linked it to uh, uh, written stories. Um, this was quite a few years ago that we did that. Now I would link it to a video. I would have a video pop up and tell a story about that stat. So yeah, you can even combine the infographics with the videos and the storytelling, all of that stuff. It gives you multiple ways to engage with people. Some people like data, some people like stories, some people like you know infographics, some people like videos, and so the more stuff you can put out there. Um, but just make sure you weave stories into all of those things, and then I think, yeah, an infographic can really can really bring data to life. Absolutely. I'll kind of add to that. Um, it, Like we kind of alluded to earlier in this webinar, it's really hard to make stats exciting. Um, but part of the reason people don't find stats exciting is because they're not visual. Um, I've had a couple people ask kind of what an infographic is and how to do it. An infographic is a is a really fun way to take a bunch of data and present it in a really visual way. So um if you like if you do what Rich talked about earlier in the in the in the webinar if you connect with donors emotionally encourage them to give and then follow up with them on with uh with stats and knowledge and facts uh an infographic is a really visual pleasing way to present statistics in a a, a form that people relate to really easily um i will also uh Let's see, I will also say a few of you have been asking us about uh, working with social media with uh, at-risk groups. Uh, Rich, do you yeah. have any input if you people are concerned about taking advantage of vulnerable yeah. populations or um, encouraging people to use social media when maybe that's an at-risk group? Do you have any any tips for that? Most definitely, most definitely. And as I mentioned, I started working with at-risk groups. So at-risk youth is what got me into the nonprofit space. So I've worked with at-risk youth, severe emotionally disturbed, foster care adoption uh, organizations, domestic violence organizations. We have a couple uh, websites we're doing right now for domestic violence organizations. And yeah, there's big concerns there about sharing their stories, about privacy issues. You know, foster kids, you can't, you can't use their real identities. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're in the system. Of them. But there are ways around this. So the things we recommend to our clients, one is, if they're adults, if they're 18 and over, you can ask them if they'd like to share their story. Um, if they want, some people really want to share it. So we found some of the domestic violence shelters I work with, they have women that are just really want to be out there sharing their stories so they can help more, more folks. So ask them if they'd like to share it. If they feel uncomfortable, you can say, can we share your story but keep you private? Um, and the way we do that is we tell the story and we use their name in quotes. So this story is about Maria, quote unquote. Uh, we're keeping uh, Maria's identity private for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, and you can even explain what those reasons are, and then just start telling the story. Um, at that point, your supporters will stop remembering that it was Maria in quotes, and they will just get sucked into that story. The same thing with foster children. And then you can use photos, uh, use photos not of their face, but you can use photos of, of the kid's hands doing some arts and crafts. You can use photos of the kids playing out on the playground, so not an identifying picture where you could see who that person was. Um, you know, and then I think this is close related to another question I saw in there. Someone asked about the uh, the, the the ad I showed for the uh, food bank. Um, were those actors or were those actual people? And you could use um, actors. You could even use a, a a a stock image if you wanted to, and under the stock image put Maria in quotes, right? If that helps them have a space to identify that. I think as long as you're honest with people that this is not really Maria, and here's why we're not really showing you Maria. I think it's the story that is most importantly. Um, and the other way to get around that is, like I said, is have, asking a staff member to tell their favorite story. It's the staff member on camera then talking about Maria 
um, and this amazing, powerful story. And people are still going to feel that emotion because that staff member, I can almost guarantee you, if it's their favorite story, they're going to start to get choked up. They're going to, you're going to see the emotion on their face as they tell the story. Um, and that's going to be relayed across the camera. That's going to be relayed right to the supporter that's, uh, that's uh, watching, watching that. So there's a bunch of ways um, to, uh, to uh, get around that. Don't, please don't, don't, don't let that stop you. Yeah, um, I have to kind of give you a resource to look at. If you are curious to see some examples of uh, people who are telling their stories without being identified uh, with their face attached to their story, there's a really great photographer who runs a project called Humans of New York. Um, mm -hmm. He includes stories from humans from New York and uh, will very often post pictures of just their hands or their feet yeah. or uh, yeah. maybe a picture with them out of focus. It might give you some really cool ideas about a way yeah. to show pieces of the person just enough to give people a, a visual to connect with without actually compromising their identity. Most definitely, um, and actually, I'll, 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 I'll add to that real quick. Humans in New York, if you want to go see how to do amazing storytelling, um, Honey does a great job of storytelling. Uh, you know, they, they raise money for, you know, for these kids in New York, and they tell some of these kids stories about kind of what the program means to them, and, man, it really shows the impact. They, they've had some amazing fundraisers. They've done some, some great fundraising campaign or uh, crowdfunding campaigns um, where all they've done is just told stories um, and use that as their fundraising vehicle. So I, a great example to, uh, to uh, go look at for sure. 100%. That is an instance of an online storyteller that has definitely moved me to tears on more than one occasion. Most definitely. Um, Anna Clapper did pipe up with a really useful piece of information that I meant to mention and didn't. Um, those of you who are asking about Facebook's EdRank uh, and how that works with, uh, with posts and whether or not Twitter has a similar algorithm, um, Instagram is a really popular method for sharing visual stories right now, and they too use a relevancy algorithm. Um, so keep that in mind as you're posting pictures on Instagram. That's another instance where encouraging people to interact with you will help get your, your information seen more quickly. Um, we've got time for one last question. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Um, Someone asked if there are any resources you can suggest that help create infographics, and I'll kind of expand that and ask for uh, resources that help people create uh, visuals in general. Yeah, so I'm, I, you're going to laugh when I tell you this, but it's, I, I do this with my clients all the time when they ask me these questions. I'll say, well, there's this great, there's this great person I know out there that knows everything, um, and her name is Auntie Google. And so I would go <laughs> to Auntie Google, and I would type in... Um, how to do a nonprofit infographic. I mean, literally just ask exactly what you want um, and you will see just some amazing examples out there. That's how I find most of my information when I want examples is I'll go out there and I'll just search and just get really specific. You can even say, how do I find, or you know, how do I do an amazing animal rescue infographic? And you will find examples of animal rescue infographics and you can just kind of get ideas. You don't want to steal someone's idea, you don't want to just copy it, um, but you can definitely uh, borrow some of their ideas and kind of see what's working out there, uh, what, what's not working, and that's kind of kind of my biggest thing. Um, infographics. If you're a visual person, there's software out there that'll help you run an infographic. Um, you can also hire people to do uh, uh, in, in infographics as well if, if, if that's not your your uh, forte. Um, but just get out there, do some Google searches, kind of go go down that rabbit hole, set aside a couple hours, and I can tell you when you start getting the infographics, they get they get very fun and, and uh, very very interesting. They do. Um, Picto chart, P I K T O chart, um, is yep. one that I know I've used to make uh, infographics, and then uh, I've also I've used Canva, um, yeah, Canva. which would, is like would, Canva without Canva. the S. Yeah. Uh, Canva is really great. They've got a lot of free tools you can use, and um, I've never used their infographic builder, which again is a way to present stats and other things really visually so it's more interesting um, but I do know I've used Canva's other tools and I've really enjoyed them so that might be another another tool that you can use um, those are all of the questions we have and it's been really fun seeing everybody get excited about about uh, how to tell stories better and tools they can use and different stories they can tell um, I will say this. I know there are a lot of QGIV users that are currently on the, the 
the webinar right now. Um, we also have tools that can help you tell your story on your donation form, on your thank you page, and in your receipts. So if you have any questions about that, please let us know. Um, we can we can show you how to do that really easily on your on your forms. Uh, Rich, is is there anything else that you'd like to tell us? Any parting words? I know you've left us with a ton of stuff to digest. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, no, I would I would leave with just what you just said there. Like, you know, that, that the QGIF software can allow you to to tell your story in places that many nonprofits don't. I mean, I get so many, so I, I donate to tons of nonprofits because I've always clients out there and if I don't donate they they get mad at me. So I donate to, you know, fifty, a hundred <laughs> nonprofits every year and I get these confirmation emails back all the time and they almost all sound exactly the same thank you so much for your gift it was amazing blah blah it's all the same but if you continued the story if you're telling the story about Marie and then I donate tell me an update on Marie you know follow up later three months later with an update on how Marie is doing and, and the difference she made but yeah use all of those tools that you have tell stories like literally everywhere your thank you message like you said on the donation page you can also be have a picture of Marie and, and have a little bit of her story there so people can see that they're donating to the right place, the same campaign, all of that. Just little things like that make, make your tools so much more powerful. The same tool, you're just adding extra emotion and just extra power into it. So I, 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 would, I would leave you with that. And, um, and yeah, get out there and just start telling more stories and you'll see some amazing success. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Rich, and thank you, everyone, for all of these awesome questions and all of these great insights, and I hope that you are really excited about telling your nonprofit story. It is the best skill to have as a nonprofit fundraiser. Um, you guys are going to do a great job, and I cannot wait to see the stories that you start telling. Uh, with that, I am going to sign off. Uh, I wish you all have the best week ever, and I will send you a follow-up shortly with a recording of this webinar and an invitation to our next one. So thank you very much. Excellent. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.